Good afternoon, I'm Rory Fitzgerald. I'm Professor of Practice and Survey Research at the City University of London, and I'll be uh, chairing today's uh, ESS City University National Centre for Social Research seminar series, the last one of, uh, before our, our summer break. Um, theme today is uh, phone to online mode shifts as part of a cross-national probability-based annual project. And we're delighted to have two colleagues today uh, from the Pew Research Centre, uh, Patrick Moynihan, who's been Associate Director of International Research Methods uh, for over five years, providing methodological leadership across the centre's cross-national projects. Uh, and and Alexandra Castillo, who's a research methodologist in International Research Methods at Pew Research Centre, and she specialises in complex sample designs, survey implementation and data assessment for international projects across the centre. So we're delighted to have them both with us today. Uh, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A and there'll be a chance for us to take them at the end. But now I'll hand over to Alexandra, who's going to be the main presenter today. Over to you, Alexandra. Hi, everyone. Okay, great. You can hear me. So my oh, name is... Can. <laughs> I'm uh, Alexandra, thanks for the introduction, um, and I'm going to be uh, talking to you today about an ongoing research project of migrating from phone to online as part of a probability-based multinational project. So before beginning, we'd just like to thank the organizers of the seminar series at City University of London, the European Social Survey, and NatSEN Social Research. So as was already mentioned, I'm joined today by my co-author, Associate Director of International Research Methods, Pat Moynihan, and he'll be joining me for the Q&A. And lastly, we'd just like to thank our colleagues at the Center for their continued support of this ongoing work. So I'll start the presentation today by providing you with some background on the Pew Research Center and our cross-national probability-based international surveys. So next, I'll highlight some of the main factors that we consider for mode shifts, including both methodological and operational considerations. From there, I'll provide background on the two online panels that motivate the rest of the presentation. So these are representative probability-based panels in Australia and the UK. I'll walk you through our research approach, provide some technical details from the panels, and finally, we'll go over some high-level results and preliminary takeaways from the analyses. I'll conclude by summarizing what we've learned so far, as well as proposing avenues for continued exploration. And then we're looking forward to uh, all of the questions. So for those who are interested, here's some more information about the Pew Research Center. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-advocacy fact tank. And a key part of our mission is to share high quality survey data and analysis to help inform public dialogue. So we have 10 research programs and most of those are focused domestically, but today we'll be discussing our international research agenda at the intersection of methods and the global attitudes and trends team. So to start with the Pew Research Center's Global Attitudes Survey, it's our annual cross-national survey of about 20 to 40 countries and it's been ongoing since 2001. So at least historically, most of our surveys have been based on telephone and face-to-face -face methods, and they're all nationally representative probability-based samples of adults 18 plus. So our surveys are typically translated into more than 40 languages, um, and all of them have around 1,000 respondents each. So just for some background, here are some of the topics that are typically covered by our Global Attitude Survey. We have geopolitical questions, questions on democracy, multilateralism, global threats, and we also include other topics and special topics. So the coronavirus has uh, frequently been popping up on these surveys, and then we'll ask regional questions as appropriate. So just for a sense of our spread, so this map shows all of the countries that have been surveyed at least once by the Pew Research Center, and this is across all of our international projects. So in total, we've surveyed in 113 countries. So those countries that are unshaded on this map are countries that we've never pulled in. And again, most of these samples have about 1,000 adult, uh, adults in the, in the sample. So this slide shows our, our geographic coverage from 2015 to 2019, again, across all center projects, and this time by most recently used mode. 
So those countries that are surveyed in face-to-face -face are highlighted in blue, and those that are, are green are surveyed by phone. So as you can see, we've relied pretty heavily on face-to-face -face methods until the pandemic really made this mode of surveying not viable beginning in 2020. So we are cautiously beginning to return to face-to-face -face methods, but the pandemic, along with a host of other factors, have caused us to seriously consider the opportunity for mode transitions where available and potentially viable. So before delving into the specifics of this research effort, I wanted to first provide some background on the considerations we confront when thinking about using one mode of data collection versus another in any single country. So first, let's start with those methodological factors in, modes, in mode selection. So to begin with, obviously, there are direct trade-offs between modes in terms of coverage of the target population. So phone or web surveys might be able to include more remote populations or those in difficult to access communities like gated communities um, than a face-to-face -face survey. But on the other hand, it could also be the case that a phone or a web survey does not cover another critical population like those without a working phone or without access to the internet. So we also know that non-response error plays out differently across both phone, across phone, face-to-face -face, and web surveys. But really the key question is ascertaining uh, how those who don't respond are different than those who do and how these non-responders might differ across modes. So we do know some patterns of non-response that are unique to each mode. So for example, you know, in our face-to-face -face surveys, we generally gain higher rates of cooperation than phone. We also tend to find you know, more women in face-to-face -face and on landlines and more men on mobile. And for online panels, they have the advantage of knowing more about who chooses not to participate in a given wave, but we may not know much about those who are not covered by the recruitment methods. So there are also some measurement differences between modes. So interviewer administered modes allow interviewers to build rapport with respondents. And this has impact on data quality and respondent motivation. So online interviewing without interviewers works particularly well for sensitive questions, but it also deals with issues of attention and motivation. So speaking to those last points, another consideration is the length of the interview. And this is really taking into account the number of questions and the depth of questions that need to be asked. So Pew surveys tend to run about 20 to 30 minutes long. And so we have faced struggles throughout the years on phone surveys. This is a long survey and it's even longer in some languages than others. So for projects that have really long questionnaires, you know, phone simply is not necessarily a good choice as it's really difficult to keep respondents interested and motivated on the phone for so long. Um, but this is one advantage of online interviewing that might have uh, some advantages here. And then lastly, thinking about trend. So the center has a really long history. And in, uh, in terms of preserving this trend, there's a number of questions that we've been asking for many years. So one of the key deliverables for us is to be able to report on whether views have changed over time or not. However, when we're considering a change in mode, there can be effect on responses as well as sample composition that might distort this time series data, which we'll get into in just a moment. So along with those methodological considerations, we also face a variety of operational considerations. So Pew Research Center, like most all clients for international survey projects, does not actually send our staff to do interviewing in country. We don't make the phone calls. Um, so we really are dependent on whether quality providers in, exist in a country that are able to execute the survey as we see fit and adhere to best practices. So for online panels, one of the crucial considerations for us is that we have probability-based methods of recruitment um, and of sampling from, from the panel itself. And we also need an ability to survey yearly um, in order to field this annual cross-national survey. So really thinking about the methods undergirding these panels, as well as the ability for repeated surveying across time. So costs are certainly another consideration as well, and they you know, vary across countries and by modes. So it might be in some cases that phone surveying is cheaper than face-to-face, -face, uh, particularly if the infrastructure is already built up because there's no need you know, to send interviewers across an entire country. Um, but in countries where the cost of labor is not necessarily that high, you know, face-to-face -face can be more cost-effective than phone. So online panels, 
also might be more cost effective than either interview or administered mode, um, but they have pretty high startup costs and the overall pricing can certainly change into the future. So last consideration um, is also the length of field work. So phone surveys are typically much faster to field than face-to-face, -face, all things being equal, and online surveys have even shorter field periods. This is only one consideration, and for some project, perhaps time is not a scarce resource, but at least for the Global Attitudes project specifically, we really aim to administer our annual survey around the same time um, in all countries that are being surveyed in a given year. Okay, so lastly, and really diving into the meat of this presentation, are the effects of a migration process. So this raises the organizational costs in some ways of moving from one established mode to a new one. So there are lots of decisions regarding trend data, cross country comparability and design choices that all come into play. So it's not to say that this can't be done. And we have some recent examples of where we have actually made some recent, recent mode migrations. So on the Global Attitude Survey in particular, we migrated from face-to-face -to, -face to phone in both Italy and Greece. And we've also recently migrated for the same survey from phone to online panels in the United States and Australia. So for a little bit of background on, um, on the center and our ATP, most of our domestic work was largely transitioned to the American Trends Panel in around 2018. And the Global Attitudes Project survey began regularly collecting data on this same panel in 2021. So similar to the research efforts I'm about to discuss, before we made this transition for the Global Attitudes Projects, we fielded fair, parallel phone surveys and panel surveys uh, domestically in 2020, which really allowed for a thorough analysis of the mode transitions impact on trends and editorial decisions. So if you're curious about reading more about this domestic transition of our international survey effort, you can visit our decoded blog uh, and read more about our analysis there. So the center's decision to adopt an online panel as its main mode of, of data collection, at least domestically, is really in line with other large scale survey efforts. So as you're all probably familiar with, the ESS announced this year that it would also be transitioning its primary data collection method from face to face to a web first self completion design that offers both uh, web completion and paper completion, although this transition um, is not anticipated for a few years. Just for a little bit of background on our domestic uh, platform, the American Trends Panel, it's a national probability-based sample of adults who take surveys for us, and it's been around since 2014. The survey administration is 100% online, and those households that do not have internet access are provided with tablets and data plans. So for, as of now, we're conducting about two to three surveys per month, and they range in length from about eight to 15 minutes. Um, and they offer incentives of about, you know, five to $20 for each survey. And as I've already mentioned, it's now the primary platform for our domestic data collection efforts. So all of this brings us back to uh, the annual cross-national global attitudes projects, um, where again, we've traditionally been relying on phone and face-to-face. So even before the pandemic, we faced growing challenges in terms of sample performance, data quality, in-country capacity, and costs. So the goal of the rest of the presentation is really thinking about assessing the viability of some select online panels for our international survey efforts. So in recent years, these nationally representative online probability-based panels have emerged and are continuing to grow in some countries. And this presents a potential solution to some of those difficulties just mentioned, as well as the, the major difficulty of the pandemic. And so where available, you know, these panels do offer similar or better, better sample compositions, high quality data, shorter fieldwork timelines, and all of this comes at a lower cost. So I'm going to be talking to you today about a particular research effort in, um, where we focused on fielding concurrent gap surveys using phone and nationally representative online panels in two countries, Australia and the UK. So why these two countries? Well, both of them have faced sample performance problems. We've seen growing sample underperformance among key subgroups of analysis, such as those with lower education. Cost is also a factor, as I've outlined before, uh, and these two countries were some of the most costly countries to conduct national RDD surveys for the center. 
Both uh, the UK and Australia are editorially important to our work as well. So we have longstanding trends in both countries. In the UK, our data goes all the way back to 2002. And both of these countries are key partners to the United States in different regions of the world. These two countries also have, uh, have probability-based commercial online panels that are methodologically aligned with the sender's standards. Um, and this is certainly not something that's ubiquitous internationally. Okay, so what did we do? Well, in summer 2020 and spring 2021, we fielded concurrent phone surveys alongside the panels. So we used the CADI data for continuing to report our Global Attitudes Project data, and we really used the online panel data for those two years first for exploratory purposes. So this was a similar approach that was taken with the past mode transitions for both the US within the American Trends Panel, as well as those other efforts that I've mentioned with the Global Attitudes Project um, in Italy, as an example. So for our phone surveys, we followed the standard methodology using our random digit dial computer assisted telephone interviewing uh, for reporting. And then we adapted those phone questionnaires from interviewer administered to self administered online format. And this allowed us to make comparisons between sample de demographics and attitudinal measures. So it's important to note, or perhaps interesting to note, that we did end up publishing a small qualitative report using the open ends from this online panel exploratory data in 2021. And you can see a screen grab from that report on the right. And then as a result of some of this research, we made the decision to field the Life in Australia panel uh, for our Global Attitudes Project in 2022. So for some background information on both of these online panels, we use the Life in Australia panel um, in Australia and we use Kantar's Public Voice in the UK. So both of these panels are high quality probability-based nationally representative samples. And at least at the time of fielding, they provided coverage for offline populations. So Australia used RDD or address-based sampling for its panel recruitment, while the UK used face-to-face -face or address-based recruitment. And both panels provide national coverage of adult populations. And both of them also use a model-based weighting approach where they take into account probabilities of selection from recruitment, non-response, as well as uh, population benchmarks. So diving into Australia first, the slide is just showing you the technical details from those two waves of concurrent surveys and then the 2022 panel survey that was fielded on the most recent round of GAP. So as you can see, the bridge surveys were fielded during overlapping timeframes, and they have similar sample sizes and margins of error. For the Australian panel, the offline population represents a very small proportion of the overall sample. And if you note across the slide, this proportion is continuing to decrease over time. I've also provided the completion rates here for the online panels, as well as the response rates for phone and the cumulative response rates for the panel. And so again, to hammer this home, you know, we made the decision in 2022 to field um, our GAP survey on this Australian panel for the first time. And again, here are the details for the United Kingdom panel. So you can note those field periods in 2020 and 2021. And again, we took pains to field them concurrently. Uh, you'll note that the UK panel had larger sample sizes across both years, and the offline population makes up a slightly larger percentage um, than the Australian panel. So you'll note that in 2022, we continued to field the United Kingdom panel or the United Kingdom Global Attitudes Survey via phone. And this was really because in 2022, we had a, a, a special project where a majority of our G7 countries included an oversample of young adults. So given the needs, uh, the editorial needs and the reporting needs for analysis, the decision was made relatively early into the cycle to field the survey on the phone for the ease of comparability with the other countries included um, in the Global Attitudes Project. So as if you'll note though, um, we did still publish from the UK panel and that special report in late 2021. Um, so you'll again here, you'll see the completion rates and then I've, uh, I've provided the response rates and the cumulative response rates respectively by mode. So starting with sample composition, both panels perform similarly, if not better than RDD phone surveys across key variables for post ratification. So this slide is showing Australia as an example, and you can see that the 
the sample or the sample composition was comparable across gender, age, region, and urbanicity. So as you can see here, the phone survey performed slightly better than the panel survey on education compared to national parameters, but both similarly overrepresented those with a higher education while falling short on those with lower educational attainment. So regarding non-response, the panels tend to have much less non-response on key demographic questions than phone surveys. The question I'm showing you here is a little bit of an exception since we asked about educational attainment on both, the, on both waves of the Australian survey in order to draw direct comparisons with the way that we have historically measured education and our Australian phone surveys. So the findings that I've just described and I'm showing here are very similar to what we found in the UK. We also had higher rates of educational attainment on the phone and panel than in national estimates. And in the UK, the panel actually performed better on gender and age, although both samples, again, were relatively similar. So while they make up a small proportion of both the Australian and the UK sample overall, it is important to note that the offline populations in both countries did tend to be slightly older and less educated than the online populations. All right, so now I'll tell you a little bit about the questionnaire design for our bridge surveys that were fielded in 2020 and 2021. So we've limited the mode analysis in the coming slides to attitudinal questions. So we did not include demographics, and by here I mean things like religiosity, income, or party affiliation, although we are continuing to analyze the samples by these characteristics. I'm also not including any benchmarks in the coming slides, and so for benchmarks that's things like phone ownership and household size. So both, uh, both survey waves included modules on international affairs and foreign policies, such as views about world leaders. They also included other topics like COVID-19 and climate change. And there were some country specific questions. So there was a module on relations with China and Australia, and there were questions about Brexit in the UK. And so in the 2021 survey particularly, both panels also included experimentation regarding the display of response options. So this graph on the right is really just showing the number of items compared for those parallel phone and panel surveys in 2020 and 2021. So for each question in our bridge surveys, we analyze the percentage point differences between the phone and the panel. So for a given question, what I'm showing you here is the largest absolute difference across all response options, excluding don't know and refused an answers. So I'm using the 2021 Australia surveys as an illustrative example, and you can see that more than half of the largest observed mode differences were six percentage points or less. And this is true for the 2020 waves of the survey in UK and Australia as well. So most of those questions with large mode differences, and so here I'm going to define that as an observed mode difference of around seven points or more, and these tended to be related to two topics, foreign policy and the coronavirus. So domestic politics and the economy also elicited some mode differences, but these were to a much lesser extent than those previous two topics. So in the coming slides, I'm going to focus on examples of the types of questions that have mode differences of 10 points or higher. So really focusing on that largest group there um, while offering takeaways regarding how these differences, although large, don't necessarily present an insurmountable problem for reporting data or continuing trends. Before I do that, though, um, I want to show you one exception. So the UK survey in 2021 is sort of the opposite of the previous slide, where a majority of our mode differences are large. So unlike the other three waves of parallel surveys, here we're seeing most of our differences being in the seven points or higher categories. So of the 35 questions with these large mode differences, 28 of them were asked as four point scales. So just to give you an example of what this looked like, uh, views of the current economy in the UK in 21 stands out indicative of a larger trend. So for this question, 55% of panel respondents characterized the economy as somewhat bad compared to around a third of phone respondents. And this is a 23 point uh, mode difference for this question. So this is really consistent with a larger trend, which I'll continue to speak to throughout the presentation, where we're seeing online respondents tending to offer more negative responses uh, than the phone counterparts. So while the previous two slides excluded item non-response, generally item non-response does not contribute to the majority of observed mode differences that I've shown on those previous two slides. So we do have uh, different methods for dealing with item non-response by mode. 
So for phone surveys don't know and refused are volunteered responses. Interviewers are trained to probe on the first refusal before expect, accepting that response is valid. For online panels, not sure and prefer not to say options are shown in a pop-up screen if a respondent attempts to move to the next screen before choosing an answer for a given question. So as you can see on this slide here, in all item non-response differences between the phone and panel surveys were six percentage points or less in 2021. So all of these were you know, less than six percentage points in the 2021 survey. And in 2020, the pattern is very similar where we're seeing about 80% of item non-response being in that six percentage points or less category. So this is a slide from Australia, but the UK has a very similar story across both waves where 75% or more of item non-response was six percentage points or less for both waves of the survey. So all of this is to say is that our mode differences are persisting, um, but it's not necessarily attributed to high rates of item non-response that's differing across modes. So turning to that first type of question that elicits Smart, large mode differences, foreign policy, we can see that panelists are consistently more likely to express negative opinions of not too much confidence in a French President Emmanuel Macron. So even though the response options have a four point scale, the mode differences persist for this question, uh, even if we were to collapse into response polls here. And you can see that most of the movement between modes is really happening in the some confidence and not too much confidence response options. So that's the light green and the lighter blue. And this is again, as I just mentioned, representative of a general trend where we're seeing that our panelists are offering more negative response options than phone respondents. So looking in the 2021 survey, for example, the net no confidence is 40, 14 points greater on the panel than on the phone. So for this question, non-response plays a minor role, but again, it's not really enough to, to explain that persistent mode difference in both years. So one potential silver lining here is that if you compare across years within each mode, there is internal consistency with how respondents are answering. So confidence in Macron is stable across years in both modes. So there's internal consistency here. So COVID questions also tend to elicit higher mode differences in our survey than other types of questions. So using data from the UK here, we're seeing most of the movement is really happening in this a fair amount light green response option category. And for this question, which I'll get into in just a little bit later as well, collapsing categories into polls would help mitigate some of these mode differences. So on the phone in 2021, a net of 65% say that their life has changed as a result of COVID, and this is compared to 71% who say the same online. So there is still a difference, but it's, uh, it's a little bit smaller than if we were to keep the response options separate. So unlike the foreign policy question that I showed in the previous slide, another difference with the COVID questions is that they don't tend to independently have high rates of non-response on either mode, which is perhaps intuitive since it's asking about um, something that we can, we've all experienced perhaps rather than feelings about uh, the French president. So many of our questions on the 2020 and 2021 waves of the survey ask about both foreign policy and COVID. So this question here shows the intersection of both substantive topics, which leads to higher mode differences than either of the topics independently. So for these types of questions, we're seeing large mode differences across multiple response options, as well as item non-response that varies by year. So if you look at 2020, the item non-response by phone is much larger than the phone 2021 item non-response. But again, if we're looking at the trends within each mode, there is consistency in response distribution. And for respondents in Australia, it's possible that this question has low salience, which could explain the larger mode effects. Since we're talking here about uh, an international body that's far removed from Australia, um, and this could perhaps lead to the higher mode effects here. So as I've suggested thus far, for some questions where we see large mode effects within response categories, these differences can be characterized as, as differences in intensity of feeling, and thus they can be mitigated by collapsing categories. So this is a similar question that was shown earlier, except we're using Australia data here. 
So this question asks how much some respondents' life has changed as a result of the coronavirus. And in the, at the first, uh, those first bar graphs, we see an 11 point difference between the phone and online panel for both the not at all and not too much response categories. So these differences again are ones of intensity where more phone respondents say their life has not changed at all, while panel respondents are more likely to say that their life has not changed too much. So we can collapse these two categories into bimodal response set as so shown in those bottom two bar graphs. Um, and we can see that these 11 point, the 11 point mode differences here is essentially uh, mitigated by collapsing those. So as an overarching theme of the finding panel or the findings panel respondents do tend to offer more negative responses than phone respondents. So this was particularly true for that 2021 UK panel survey, as I mentioned earlier, where a majority of our questions asked had large mode differences of seven points or higher. So for the questions with larger mode differences, panelists tended to, across the board, give more negative respondents than their phone counterparts. So these three questions from the favorability battery exemplify both the uniqueness of the 2021 UK survey and that general trend that panelists do offer more negative responses. So the graphs show unfavorable, unfavorable views of the US, China, and the EU. The blue lines show unfavorable views of panelists, and these are always higher than the green lines that show the phone responses. So the distance between lines or the mode differences for these questions are much larger in the 2021 UK survey than the 2020 survey. So for example, in the US favorability graph, we see a 10 point mode difference in 2020, which then moves to a 21 point mode difference in 2021. So both the phone and the online respondents were actually growing more favorable towards China here, but the phone respondents uh, gave more favorable responses at a steeper rate. And the tendency to, for panelists to offer more negative opinions is consistent even when these mode differences are not consistently large. And you can really see this on the far right graph that shows EU favorability uh, here. So changing topics a, a slight bit. Um, so as I said earlier in that 2021 survey, we also experimented with the way in which volunteered response options were displayed on the panel. So volunteered response options have long been included in our phone surveys, and this bar graph shows the response distribution from our 2021 Australia phone survey um, for this question about economic ties. So in order to better understand how panelists might respond to volunteered responses, we randomized whether respondents were shown the volunteered response option on the skip screen or on the main screen. So this second bar graph here shows the distribution of response options when we treated the volunteer responses like a don't know or refusal. So this means that they were shown as options only if a respondent tried to skip to the next screen before choosing a response. So about half of our sample or 550 respondents in 2021 received this version of the question. So as you can see, the distribution of responses looks very similar to our phone responses, with less than 10% choosing those volunteered options on either mode. In this third bar, we have the results of the other half of the online sample, or 577 respondents, who were randomly assigned to receive the volunteered responses on the main screen. So while the combined top line results showed this question as having the, large mode the largest mode difference in the 2021 Australian survey, the experiment allowed us to disentangle the mode effect from the design choices. So when the volunteered responses were treated like a don't know or refuse, the response distribution looks much more alike. As you can see, this design choice dramatically impacts our, our response distributions with the majority of respondents choosing both, which is one of the volunteer response options when it's shown on the main screen. So in this condition, nearly seven in 10 online respondents chose one of those volunteered response options of both or neither. Or neither. So moving forward, this design choice provides a really clear path for maintaining trend data with volunteered responses. And it also provides a solution for mitigating seemingly large mode differences that are actually attributed to question format. So the same general trends that I'm showing here for Australia are also true in the United, in the United Kingdom surveys. So to really tie this back overall, so the 2021 surveys had three questions that had volunteered responses, and all of them received the split sample experimental conditions, and the outcomes all look very similar to the example on the slide for these three questions. 
So when the volunteered responses are shown on the skip screen rather than the main screen, the, aggregate mode, the aggregate mode differences presented earlier in the presentation become much more muted, although they're still present. And for the 2022 administration of the survey for online panels, we only had one question that included a volunteered response, and the decision was made to not show this volunteered response option to panelists. So lastly, although throughout we've shown that there are oftentimes large mode differences between our phone and panel data, the data from the parallel surveys does tend to move in a similar direction, although the rate of change varies. So here we're going to look at US favorability, which is a long running trend in the United Kingdom as an example. And we can see that favorability of the US increased by 23 percentage points between 2020 and 2021 among phone respondents in the UK. If we're turning to the panel data, favorability of the UK increased as well by 14 percentage points during the same time period. And this is a change in a similar direction, but at a slower rate. So at face value, while this question has a mode difference of 16 percentage points in 2021, we can characterize this again as a difference of intensity of the attitudes between modes. And this graph shows that the general directions of the attitudes are consistent with the movement over time in a similar direction. So again, this is suggestive that the online panelists might provide just less favorable responses than phone respondents. As one final point, this slide demonstrates that even within the same question, the magnitude of the mode differences can vary by year. So using views of China as an example, in 2020, the differences in point estimates for favorability of China were statistically indistinguishable. In 2021, though, we see a mode difference of seven points emerge, with favorability towards China increasing at a faster rate among phone respondents than panelists. So while favorability toward China increased among phone respondents, it remained relatively stable in our 2022 online survey. So to conclude, both modes yield similar sample compositions, which might be attributed to the fact that both uh, the phone and the online panels rely on probability-based methods. So where available, these high quality probability based online panels do offer shorter timelines, lower costs and comparable data quality, although they're certainly not ubiquitous internationally. So um, they do offer, you know, similar and comparable data quality, but the outcomes might differ. So similar to findings from the center's domestic research, we did see large mode effects for certain questions, such as ratings of political figures and countries. And for these questions, phone respondents tended to rate political figures more favorably than online panelists. But even when they were large, most of these mode differences did have similar slopes. So we also saw that design choices impact response distributions, especially for volunteered options. And again, that those mode differences were really popping for certain types of questions. So one line of inquiry for future research is whether mode differences are most common among certain perhaps low salience questions. So many of the questions on our Global Attitudes Project are related to international affairs and geopolitical issues, which may not resonate directly with our respondents. So in future research, we'd like to really dive more deeply into this analysis to ascertain you know, whether questions that are more directly relevant, perhaps highly salient uh, to respondent situation are less susceptible to mode differences. And we're also going to continue to explore the larger patterns uncovered here, namely that we saw a pattern where panelists offered less positive responses than those on the phone. But all in all, where mode differences exist, uh, you know, further exploration and testing, along with a deeper analysis of its likely causes, can really help to inform editorial decision making about report reporting trends and making the transitions in general. So you can find more about all of our work at, at our website here. Uh, you can also interact with us on social, on social media or follow our newsletter. And we're really looking forward to, uh, to your questions now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra. Fascinating presentation and all very clear. So thank you very much. Um, I've got one question already. So people do have questions if they could put them in the Q&A. Um, and also if Patrick wants to to join us, that would be wonderful, thank you. So one question first from Don Dillman. Uh, is it possible that obtaining more positive responses from phone is a visual versus an oral effect? 
That is where visual responses are more prominent in people's minds, and as a consequence, used more often, whereas oral responses more likely to remember the extreme categories. That's a great question. And, and yeah, some of our previous domestic work has found just that, right? That there might be, um, you know, some, some recency bias with the phone, with phone surveys that online panels don't necessarily face because they are able to, you know, visually uh, display these response options. Um, so we haven't, you know, done a thorough analysis of this yet, uh, but it does seem to be at least highly consistent with what some of our domestic research um, has has documented throughout the years. Thank you. Just whilst we wait for some other questions coming, I, I've got one myself. Um, editorially, how do you deal with this? Where you know you've got these panels in a few countries, and you're maybe moving to use the Australia panel instead and, and drop phone, but other countries you've only got phone. So you're obviously in some countries not seeing such big changes in the time series compared to others. How do you deal with that when you're reporting to the media or? clients? Yes, this is the million dollar question. This is the most difficult part to answer. Um, and so we have a couple of different um, tactics under our belt. So, um, you know, as we've seen with just those couple of questions that I've shown in the presentation, every question is different. Um, some questions have, uh, you know, larger mode differences where others, where others don't. Um, but one thing that we always do when we're discussing, you know, the the results is we'll call out specifically that this country, even if you know, even if the trend line is consistent, has had a change in mode. Um, and then we do have the really tough decision uh, of what to do when we have large mode differences. Um, and so, in some cases, the decision has been to truncate trend. You know, if the if the response patterns are so different um, across modes that it would be um, in some ways insincere to present this as a continued trend, then that's a, a decision that's made. Um, and then a, a sort of a third tool that we have is to it's just kind of do what I've shown here in those long term graphs, which is to show both um, to let you know the readers or our audience sort of see these differences and how they're moving you know, either in parallel with each other or not. Um, but of course, you know, adding this third mode does make things really <laughs> editorial di editorially difficult. Um, and so we do our best to be as transparent as possible, both in the text and visually by calling out wherever this is, you know, that these are different modes, we're asked in slightly different ways. Um, and of course, all of this is covered in the methodology as well, but it does, you know, it really, it, it really takes a lot of time to make a transition like this. And there are really difficult, painful decisions sometimes um, when it does come to our, to our trend data. Excellent, thank you very much. That's, it is a tricky area, isn't it? That, that reporting, so that was very helpful to, to hear how you do, deal with that. Are there any other questions that the audience would like to ask? Oh, Patrick, did you want to add something? Yes, to add in there, Rory, and I agree with Alex's points. I think uh, it's very helpful, at least in, in our case, uh, to have an accompanying uh, piece. Uh, Alex had some screenshots of some blogs explaining some of these differences at greater length than simply including a dotted line in a, in a, in a long-term time series uh, chart to suggest a a, a mode shift. So it's a, I think the accompanying pieces, it's opportunities like this one, in fact, that led us to explain and, um, and listen to uh, other uh, perspectives on it that are simply helpful in, in sharing and uh, sharing the challenges, not just the data. Yeah, it was interesting. You mentioned that as I was in your presentation about the, the ESS plan to mode shift and what we're trying to do there, whether it will work or not, we'll have to see. But what we're trying to do is to get all countries to change in the same round rather than have different rounds. And that, of course, will be challenging, more challenging for some than others, and may come at other methodological crises. We'll have to see how that works. Are there more questions? Yes, there is. Uh, there's one here. Sorry if I missed because I was a few minutes late. Are you planning to move to online panels or continue with multiple modes from um, Alex Poppy? Sure. So, you know, one of the one of the constraints we're facing is that these, you know, uh, online panels, at least the ones that are consistent with our our international methodology, just don't exist everywhere. Um, so in that sense, like our hands are, are pretty limited. But where they do exist, we are continuing, you know, with this experimentation. Um, but for the for the immediate future, 
um, there are there just aren't you know some of these probability based uh, online panels in all countries. So, for example, we like to to survey in Asia and Africa, and and there just aren't uh, places for us to do surveys like this. Um, and so, in you know, in some cases, face to face is going to continue to be our mode for the foreseeable future. In the same way that you know, phone will continue to to be in play for other countries as well. Um, so this is going to be a long-term process for us, and we're going to you know, continue to experiment where we can, um, but at least for the foreseeable future, we will continue to have um, three modes of data collection. Thank you. Please do continue to ask questions. Whilst we're waiting for another one to come in, I'll fire another one of my own off because I'm fascinated by this. Um, you, there's bigger differences over time between the phone and the online panels, it appeared. Is your sense that that's because the phone mode is becoming poorer quality, that actually less people are now answering the phone, that they're, or the types of people that are answering the phone are, are difficult? Is that, is that what's behind those differences? Or is it because I don't know, there's a problem with the panels, then they're, they're not you know, refreshing their panels properly? Or something. What, what's the reason for this divergence, do you think? Yeah, so that's a that's a really tricky tricky question. You know, ideally we would we could have had uh, you know parallel surveys when you know um, when phone surveys were receiving much or getting much higher response rates than what we have now. Um, but at least you know for the two waves that we have, the the response rates are sort of consistent. It's not like we saw an increase or a decrease. So I don't think that at least with the data we've collected that we can speak to that specific question about. Um, you know, about if it's just the sample we're getting on the phone being, you know, less, uh, less representative, for example. Um, but all in all, you know, we did see that both the samples were relatively comparable, um, which would lead us to conclude that it might just be something about the administration of the questions on these different modes, um, ideally. Now, of course, we can't control for, for everything. Um, everything else in this uh, sort of in this analysis. Um, but yeah, that's a really tricky question. Pat, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Alex. It is, and it, it, it's hard, Rory, to extrapolate from the, from the say, in the UK data, the two data points we have. So the, the 2020 would seem uh, much more in line with the, uh, the phone work. But then the uh, the panel work in 2021 seems to diverge a, a bit more, so it's it's a fair question you raise. But I don't think there are any data quality metrics in the phone surveys that would suggest that it's much poorer quality from one year to the next. And that might be a better argument over a uh, course of 10 years. It, it is challenging though when you're looking at response rates that for phone that move from the single digits to the lower single digits. So. It seems that you're, you know, the degrees to which you have to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, improve quality, I'll, I'll phrase it that way, are, are fairly limited. And there wasn't a particular change, for example, in the, the panel composite, on the panel composition in the UK that you're aware of, was there wasn't a change in the recruitment, more people recruited on the phone rather than face-to-face -face or anything like that. It was pretty much, pretty much the same panel panelists as before. Yeah, so at the time of the of of the last uh, you know UK survey, the panelists uh, were relatively similar. Now since then, they have you know continued to refresh their panel, um, but because we are sort of working with um, a product from you know from. Uh, from a company, we don't have necessarily all of the of the parent data to, to perhaps answer that question. Although that's certainly something we can you know continue to request in the future to help us sort of untangle some of this. Um, because as of now, sort of we have you know limited data at our fingertips to sort of address um, address what we're seeing here. Great. Are there any more questions that people in the audience would like to raise? We've got a few more minutes. Or are there any further reflections that uh, either of you would like to, to raise on this work? Other than you'd love all countries to have high quality online probability panels, of course. <laughs> Especially in Europe, Rory, if uh, you can manage that. No, I think the, the uh, last question from Alex is a good one uh, about 
the plans for the next five or, or 10 years. And I think we're all grappling with that in terms of uh, in-country capacity, uh, cost and data quality. You know, when I saw Alex's question come up, I want to answer both uh, because we will continue to move online where it's possible and we will continue with multiple modes. It's, uh, it's challenging for us given the, the, the scope of the project to, to reduce the number of modes now. Um, and it's not because of the quality of panels because when they're constructed, they, uh, they perform quite well. It has more to do with just the availability of them. And for our position, it's the uh, availability of uh, you know, commercially uh, commercial panels, uh, given our model of, of polling, as Alex described. So, so there are a number of different uh, issues here that we're contending with. Um, but where we look forward to additional you know, panel work being done in Europe and in in Asia, in uh, in Africa and Latin America, which we hear, and I'm sure you do as well, Rory, um, these are under development in certain places. Uh, so we're certainly interested there. And that raises a, a host of questions about, you know, learning about the, these kinds of differences that Alex was describing and how well as, an, as a survey industry, we can, you know, cope with that. And to the degree to which we can share information and, and resources about that, would really be a step forward. You've seen you know, some of our work uh, with panels internationally, but there's only so much we can do, you know, in a sense. And uh, I'm sure you folks are looking at, at the ESS as well, but forums like, the, forums like this really do help uh, shed a lot of light on the country specific sensitivities uh, that our surveys, especially the measures will have uh, to the mode shift. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going in that case. I'm going to fire one more though. I'm going to really abuse my role as Chester. Had you mentioned that you felt that some of the items might not be very salient? You gave the example, I think, of whether Australians know about how the EU, how well the EU handled COVID. Um, is is that kind of finding going to make you rethink your your questionnaires is it is it a serious enough challenge that you think actually are we measuring like non-attitudes or do you think it's kind of a more minor concern you just need to kind of have a footnote in the in the report yeah that's a difficult question i'm going to let pat take that one first and then i will uh i'll add to his answer Yeah, no, that, that's a, it's a good question uh, on the strategy with the questionnaire content. And that it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that is difficult because I, th I think you know, this audience is well aware that foreign policy is not often top of mind for many folks in their everyday lives. So, well, you know, um, you know certain other aspects of issues you confront, like COVID, if you're, you're experiencing it directly uh, um, as part of your, your family, it might have one, uh, you, know, you might have one response, but as how the government's handling it, a much different one. Um, you know, I think it's an issue for us in terms, in a, in a couple of ways. One is measurement with, um, with item non-response and thinking seriously about how we measure it and how it's done differently online versus uh, the phone as Alex showed. So we have to continually think about that. Uh, in terms of the subject matter, Rory, that, that's a challenging one for a cross-national survey, especially a global one, because we, we are interested in you know, receiving attitudes about the same issues across countries, but not all issues have the same salience across countries. So it, it will cause us, I think you are right, to continue to think about it, something on our minds. But as we confront this mode shift, um, it's going to become an even more, if I can say, salient issue for us. And that's why I, I raised earlier this notion of fo uh, folks in the industry sharing what they're doing and the in-country differences that they are seeing. Because I think it gives all of us a, a sensibility about how to approach these issues because we certainly don't want to report on non-attitudes. That would be highly problematic. 
So your question does raise the issue, should we, should we be doing a better test of non-attitudes throughout our survey instruments? And it's def definitely a challenge I think we all face. We certainly face it in the, in the European Social Survey. We're definitely sometimes asking about things which are perhaps not top of mind to, to respondents. Thank you both very much uh, for the presentation, for, for answering the questions. And absolutely, we need to continue to, to share our experiences. And we were wanting to be doing that in the autumn. So if there are members of the audience here today who have an idea for a topic, please do get in touch with Stefan Swift at DSS HQ at City University London. We'd love to have some more ideas for the autumn. Um, if not, we hope to see many of you, not only at these presentations, but also next year at, at APOR and Ezra, which we both have to look forward to, to share some of these ideas a bit more. But thanks a very, uh, again, to Alexandra and to and we will see you again soon. Goodbye.